Welcome everyone and good morning to this morning's service of the Winchester Unitarian Society, a caring community devoted to spiritual growth, social transformation, and environmental responsibility. And as a welcoming congregation, we affirm the full inclusion of people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. As Unitarian Universalists, our faith does not require us to believe in any particular tenet or creed, and among us we believe many different things. As the first minister of this church, Richard Metcalf put it so many years ago, we do not regard even the best creed as final. We look for new truths and new statements of old ones. We maintain the unlimited right of free inquiry. But while our faith does not impose any particular theology or belief, we recognize joyfully that it does call on us to do certain things. Among them, we recognize and affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And in that spirit, we greet with joy and fellowship all who are gathering with us this morning, both in person and via live streaming. Again, welcome to you all. Before our service begins, and this is one of our summer services, as you all know, led this morning by Nancy Schrock. It's, it's on a very important topic, a very interesting topic. We're looking forward to it. But before we be, get into the service, let me just let me ask you to turn your attention to a few announcements. First, after the service, we will gather on the terrace for refreshments, and then at noon, there will be a discussion of today's service, again with our lay leader, Nancy Schrock, in the parlor. The discussion will be conducted both in person and via Zoom. And today, I want to remind you that there are only three summer services after today, only three summer services left in our schedule this season. Next week, on August 21st, we'll be presenting the Unitarian Universal Association 2022 Service of the Living Tradition, featuring Pastor Jacqueline Duhart's sermon, Radicals Rise Up Now, Now is a Moment. Pastor Duhat is the Director of Spiritual Care Services at the Star King School for Ministry. And then on August 28th, Ivan and Joshua Correa will lead a service entitled Extreme Gardening. And I'm sure you all want to be there. And, and I, I have a, an idea that we will be also serving as refreshments a panoply of Indian delicacies. And then on our final Sunday service on Labor Day weekend on September Sunday, September 4th, our service will be led this year by Lee Barton, and Lee's reflection is entitled, The Open Mind and Its Enemies. I know that you don't want to miss any of these coming summer services, which will be available again via live streaming, as well as for those attending in person. So if you're off in Maine canoeing, you can always take your phone and watch it while on the water. Now, for those in the sanctuary, let's all give a wave to those of us who are joining through live stream. And now let us take a few moments to greet one another briefly, and you'll all be called back into service by the ringing of the bell from our partner church in Maharshave, Transylvania.
Thank you for welcoming me to the pulpit. My name is Nancy Schrock, and I began coming to services here at the invitation of Vicki Cocoludo and Marilyn Mullane about four years ago. Sadly, COVID arrived shortly afterwards, so I've not met many of you face to face, though I do see many friends out in the audience. I have lived in Winchester for 40 years, and most of those years I've been involved with preserving the history of the town in its archives and a historical society. More recently, we have turned our attention to making documents, especially photographs, accessible. Today, I would like to share what I, we have learned about the black community in Winchester, 1880 to 1970. When I talked about my topic with Heather, she gave me a copy of Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. I was surprised to learn that the author was from Winchester, where she said, quote, everyone everywhere was white. Today I'd like to examine that view of Winchester and share a less well-known history of the town. Our chalice white lighting words this morning are by Kimberlyn, Kimberly, Ayn, Tomstock, Carlson. We are a people of memory. As inheritors of our ancestors' legacy, we hold their stories tenderly, gleaning wisdom from diverse journeys, united in hope for the future. Guide us to trust in love as we kindle this flame together.
Our first reading is a poem by Terry Carter, Medford Poet Laureate. It's called The Warming of Other Suns. They made their way north in caravans to cities of industry, jobs, and hope, sometimes with just the clothes on their backs. They ran from the Klansmen and racist attacks. They'd witnessed lynchings. They dined on Jim Crow. And thus the South would provoke them to go in search of other suns, warmer suns. We now come to the part of our service where those in attendance are invited to come forward if they have a joy or sorrow to share with the congregation, uh, to identify themselves, speak their joy or sorrow, and then light a candle. Um, and I remind everyone who does come up that this service is being streamed and of course will be archived, so anything you do say will be available uh, on the internet to a much wider audience than the people here. Uh, would anybody like to come forward and light a candle? My name is Claire McNeil, and my husband and I, speaking of the generations passing, celebrated our 55th wedding anniversary last night with our children and grandchildren. Very simple gathering for cake and conversation and sharing some of our wedding photos. Anyone else? I'm Sandy Thompson, and I'm, I'd like to light a candle in appreciation for this wonderful service today and for this history that we're about to learn. Good morning, I'm Kathy Richardson. On Friday morning, I received a text from my sister that said, we are in the amphitheater waiting to hear Salman Rushdie speak when a man rushed the stage and attacked him. This is attack not just on a man, but on freedom of expression. I'd like to light a candle for his healing and for the healing of all that is ailing our country and our world. Raymond Duris, we have a neighbor who um, was out trying to pick up some nice flowers or sweets for his wife's birthday and um, met another car going the wrong way or maybe he was going the wrong way. It was such an accident that he couldn't remember what happened. Um, anyway, he's in much pain. He's stitched together or metal riveted together, I guess is what they do nowadays and um, in much pain, but he's a survivor, and I'd like to light a candle for him, even though he would not himself do the same. Not doing too good on this day. <laughs> 
else? Uh, I would personally like to second what Kathy Richardson said. In fact, I was standing right here when the fatwa was issued against, uh, against him, and I um, came up. At that time, joys and sorrows were part of our regular Sunday service, and I came up and expressed my distress when that fatwa was issued because of, of, of his book, Satanic Verses, at the attack on, uh, on um, freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of thought. And like Kathy, uh, I don't have that personal connection, but one hoped that this was all over, uh, but obviously it wasn't. So I also will light a candle for Salman Rushdie and for the hope that for his recovery and for constant vigilance against these attacks on freedom of thought on whatever basis they are brought or done. Having a hard time here, folks. Oh, here we go. Here's a small one. And finally, I'll light a candle for um, all those joys and sorrows that are in people's hearts that have not been expressed aloud today. Let's see if I can find a small one. We'll now have a time of silence, followed by singing the hymn named in your order of service, but singing it seated.
The second reading is from a different kind of source. It's the Winchester Star, but it's related to the poem we just read and the reflections I'm about to give. It was published on January 25th, 1901. The title was The Baptist Mission Has Important Work That Should Be Encouraged and Assisted. Quote, 10 years ago, you could count the colored people of Winchester on the fingers of a single hand. Today, today they number about 150. The bulk of these come from Virginia, some from North and South Carolina, and a few came from Canada. The disturbances in the South and the social unrest of the colored people there have set in motion a tide of emigration which is flowing to the North. Winchester is receiving her share of the oppressed. And now we'll see how the AV works. This one here? Oh, it's on. Okay, well then over to Hannah. Thank you. I would like to pick up the quote from the Winchester Star and ask the question, who were the new black citizens of Winchester in 1901? Where were they from? Why did they choose Winchester? And what was their life like here? To recover this history, I needed to search a range of sources, newspapers like the Star, census records, old photographs, maps and documents in the town archives, and the wonderful writings of our town archivist and historian, Ellen Knight. Sometimes, next slide, sometimes the evidence is lying in plain sight. Perhaps like me, you've been intrigued by the building on 12 Cross Street. When I saw a for sale sign in front, I knocked and met the owner, Robert Garante. Robert told me that it had been the New Hope Baptist Church when he bought it in 1980. He invited me inside where he had painstakingly restored the building, retaining the stage area and open floor plan so that I had a sense of the original church. For many years, he had sponsored informal jazz concerts, which seemed fitting for a building that had always valued music. I also learned that the building was among the oldest in Winchester and was first built as one of five elementary schools constructed after the incorporation of the town in 1851. But New Hope was more than the building. It was a center for the black community. Robert had gotten to know some of its members, and through him I met the granddaughters of William Smith, the longest serving minister. Let me introduce them. From left to right, they are Dorothy Elizabeth Griffith Tucker, Winston Morris, and Linda Baker Berry. The most important source of history often lies with the people themselves in interviews and oral histories. I am grateful that these gracious women shared their memories. I also spoke with longtime resident Douglas Cromwell, who provided additional details. So who were Winchester's first black residents? The 1860-80 census showed 10, five to 10 people who worked temporarily as laborers and domestics all born in Massachusetts or neighboring states. They did not stay long and did not appear in later, later census reports. By the 1900 census, however, the number had jumped to 150. The result of emigration from the South with a few coming from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. They made Winchester their home, worked in its factories and houses, 
bought homes and found an identity in their church. The Winchester arrivals reflected these broader patterns seen on the map and came from the state shown along the east on the yellow route northward. Ten families, including some of the early founders of the New Hope Church, came from Halifax County in southern Virginia, colored red in this map. Genealogical research identified Birch Creek, Pennsylvania, Halifax, and Bannister as their origins. Linda Berry recalled her family coming from Finneywood, which was the name of an extensive plantation in Mecklenburg County near Halifax. It was one of several complexes where enslaved Africans labored as the property of white owners. After the end of the Civil War, many continued to work the fields as sharecroppers or tenant farmers growing tobacco, the cash crop of that fertile area. Forbidden to go to school before 1865, they could now learn to read, but schooling for their children ended at sixth grade. The period known as Reconstruction ended in 1877 when Union troops withdrew from the South, leaving former Confederates to impose Jim Crow laws that led to segregation. In response, blacks moved north in what became known as the Great Migration. But why did they choose Winchester? I asked Linda Berry why her family came to Woburn. I think that there was an underground railroad station in Woburn. I think that part of the family came up during the Civil War or before. People typically chose places where they had connections and Woburn was definitely part of the Underground Railroad. Once here, they looked for jobs, and Winchester offered employment. We think of Winchester as a residential community, but in fact, it had industry from its beginnings because of the water power of the Aberjona. Like Woburn, there were mills and tanneries. At the turn of the century, Winchester, north of the center, looked more like Lowell or Lawrence than the town we recognize today. The Beggs and Cobbs tannery dominated the corner of Swanton and Main Streets. When it burned in 1969, the area was zoned residential and replaced by the Parkview Apartments. The McKay Fastener Company, later the Puffer Soda Fountain Factory, occupied 15 acres on the property, now the site of the transfer station. John Maxwell's Eagle Tannery on Cross Street became the Witten Gelatin Factory in 1902. Woburn's tanneries and gelatin factories also offered employment in walking distance from, Winche from North Winchester. This is what the Witten factory really looked like across the Aberjona. Among the jobs listed in the census were couriers, leather finishers, day laborers, glue workers, janitors, screen makers, farm laborers, barber, coachman, freight handler, and others. Domestic jobs were also available. In 1930, 40, 45 blacks were live-in servants at homes on Bacon, Cabot, Calumet, Dix, Fletcher, Glen, Glengarry, Lakeview, Norwood, Swan Road, and many others. This photograph was taken at 6 Cliff Road in 1900 and shows Nanny Gardner born in Virginia with her charges. Domestic help also lived in the plains and walked to work as washerwomen and cleaners. Where were their homes? The newly arrived families lived in the plains, the north end of town bordering Woburn, indicated by the black arrow. 
The area was less desirable for housing because it was adjacent to factories and the then marshy Aberjona River. It was finally developed in the 1890s when the Suburban Land Improvement Company laid out 100 lots between Cross and Swanton Street. Small and affordable, these provided homes for factory workers. By 1916, black, blacks owned nearly half of the 51 houses on Harvard and Irving Streets. Sometimes families rented out rooms to men who had come to find work before bringing their families. These photographs from a photo album that Bruce Jones shared with the archives shows the area around 68 Harvard Street with its open space. I particularly like this picture of Spencer Jones with his family from 1910. 30 years later, cars had replaced the horses, but the area still had an open, almost rural feel. This is 7 Harvard Street today. It was owned by Reverend Smith and served as the de facto New Hope Rectory for 30 years. The need for a church was felt immediately. In 1893, Oliver Barksdale, formerly a deacon in White Oaks Church in Bannister, brought together fellow Baptists in his home. The First Baptist Church in Winchester established a mission, which was served by a series of young ministers. In 1896, the church received permission to use the old Washington School. It was incorporated in 1905 as the New Hope Church. This map shows the neighborhood around 1900. The right pointing arrow shows the allotments that would become Harvard and Irving Street. The upward pointing arrow shows the lot that the early church members bought for a new church building. Other arrows show the Witten factory and the first and second Washington schools. William H. Smith became minister in 1907 and guided the congregation for 30 years. He was born in Halifax County in 1870 and grew up on a farm with little opportunity for schooling. In his early 20s, he came north to Woburn and found employment in the leather tannery. He became affiliated with St. John's Baptist Church in Woburn and began his education for the ministry through mentorship and courses at Andover Newton Theological Seminary. Seminary. In 1922, he negotiated with the town to swap that small parcel of land owned on Washington Street for the old school building. The town wanted the lot for Leonard Field. The church hired Stoneham architect Elmer Chapman to design a church using the original school building. This is one of the original blueprints submitted to the state. The building was raised up on a new foundation so that there were high ceilings for a downstairs meeting area and kitchen. The Methodist Church was building a new church at the same time and gave New Hope its windows and pews, as is seen in this view of the interior. Dorothy, Elizabeth, Winston, Linda, and Doug shared their memories of church life. Dorothy, Elizabeth noted, we had both morning and evening services, so I had to take a nap because I had to go to both services, which I didn't like very much. <laughs> Sunday school was after the regular service, and then we would come back for BYO, Baptist Youth Fellowship, where we teenagers debated like mad. Winston was a generation later. When I attended the church, the Baptist population had dwindled, so we didn't have a big service at all. But there was Sunday school held downstairs. I took piano and violin lessons, so when we no longer had a church pianist, I played the piano during the church service. 
Linda noted, the church had a full basement that was used for all various activities. If there was a wedding upstairs, there was a reception downstairs. Dorothy Elizabeth added, well, I know my father cooked a lot of pancakes. The men were great cooks, and that's the only time they really showed their cooking skills. They all remembered the outdoor Easter sunrise service. Quote, afterwards we had this great big breakfast, which was wonderful. We had bacon and eggs and pancakes and sausage and biscuits and baked beans and juice and coffee and milk. Good smells coming from the kitchen and everyone seemed happy. The whole neighborhood came. All of them recalled the July colored picnic held in the Salem Willows Amusement Park as the highlight of the summer when they got to see all their cousins. I learned there was a network of black Baptist churches that shared ministers and ministry in Winchester, Woburn, Medford, Malden, and Everett. They all participated. It was a continuation of Negro Election Day celebration begun in 1714 in Salem, and it's now continued as the Black Picnic again in July. New Hope was known for the quality of its music. The choir was invited to perform in the 150th anniversary celebration of the town's incorporation. Thanks to, you can see their songs listed here, and thanks to John Kramer, we listened to some of the pieces they performed. But blacks and Italians and other newcomers were not welcome everywhere in town. For example, Winchester did not build a public swimming pool. While the west side had its boat club, country club, and tennis courts, the plains had Leonard Pond across from the Witten factory. The depression hit Winchester and the number of factories dropped from 20 to 13, and families did without maids. In 1940, Lewis Parkhurst of the Unitarian Society led a drive to pay off the mortgage for New Hope. In his article in the Star, he notes that the number of blacks had dropped from 250 to 150 as people moved to find new employment. The drive was successful, and the church continued for 30 more years, but numbers steadily declined. Some of the drop was caused by members joining the other churches, but there were, was also an exodus of blacks from Winchester. Doug Cromwell mentioned, it was simply that there was an opportunity here, but there was also a growing feeling that they weren't welcome, and it was felt more by the generation between my father and me. My dad never had any problems, but the children of his generation were the ones who left, like the Barksdales, who had been here forever. And there was the issue of housing. I felt that black people were destined to one area, and that area was set aside. I remember my father saying that more affluent African Americans tried to get housing on the west side and they would be steered to this neighborhood. Oops, we're, we should be back one slide. Oh, oh my goodness. Could you go forward to, I'm sorry, there. That's the slide, it should be. Um, that's my fault, not our able technician in the back. Um, indeed, the redlining maps for Winchester of 1938 attest to this. Although Winchester had no red area, the plains and the factory housing west of Maine to the cemetery were labeled in yellow as, quote, declining. While the Irish and Italians could move to the suburban housing being built in the former farms along Johnson Road on the west side, black people could not. 
now the next, now we have to go back one there. Now we're on track. The last minister of New Hope was Benjamin Berry, husband of Linda Berry, Baker Berry, with whom I spoke. She described the last years of the church. Ben began a few other non-Sunday activities like a bowling league Epicurean club where they would go out for dinner. However, the average age was 70, so they were dying off one by one. When he took over, there were only 12 members left, but by the end, there were only six. The biggest activity was putting a roof on the church. It was literally caving in, so Ben got hold of the music director at Morehouse College, which has a fantastic traveling choir, and made arrangements for them to come up. We sold enough tickets to fill the high school, Lincoln then, and had the reception in the Unitarian Church. It was a huge event, biggest of the year in town except for the Anka Fair. While the church raised enough money to roof the church, it closed shortly thereafter. The building became overgrown as the Baptist church figured out what to do with it. The church members tried to find an arts group in town to purchase it, but neighbors did not want traffic. Finally, the Baptist church released it for sale. Thanks to Robert Garante, it remains intact as a building, now a home. I would like Dorothy Elizabeth and Winston to have the final words. I asked them what they would like you to remember about New Hope. Dorothy Elizabeth said, well, the New Hope Baptist Church was actually community and immunity. It was the place where we did and learned everything. We learned about black history, we learned naturally about our faith, and we learned about music. Winston said, it should be the church should be preserved as a historic site because there was so much history of African Americans and maybe the only history that's left of African Americans in Winchester. And Dorothy Elizabeth has the final word. This was a space for survival. This was a space where people could find out who they really were, not being defined by other people. And that's what I call a shelter a place where you can come and learn about you as a person and get the self-respect, your own self-respect, even if nobody else chooses to give it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We now come to the time in our service when we ask for an offering. And once again, if I were to ask myself why I'm a member of this church and why my wife and I have faithfully attended it for so many years, all I would have to do is think of a service like the service today um, to have my answer. And this service, it seems to me, yet again demonstrates why this church is so worthy of our financial support and so we're now asking those here to make an offering that helps us exercise our generosity of spirit, an offering that will help support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. And I want to note, as Nancy alluded, the choir will be singing during the offering the same hymn that the New Baptist Mixed Choir sang at the 150th anniversary of the founding of Winchester. The morning offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
Those who wish to do so are invited to join me in reciting in unison the affirmation in your order of service. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. We create and reaffirm this covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. And now please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, number 148, Let Freedom Span Both East and West. Our benediction this morning comes from, is written by Terry Carter, the Medford Poet Laureate. In the rural manse and the urban sprawl, he left a love of harmony. He left the hope of dreams. He left a land awakened to the song of diversity and the soul of the rainbow.
Please join me in reciting the words for extinguishing our chalice, which are in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our service is ended. Our life of service continues. We will have some refreshments on the terrace. And then after that, we will, those who wish to stay for a discussion, we will be gathering in the parlor at noon. Thank you all. <laughs>